Will's going to speak. Will's going to speak on the associations, as I understand it, if this is right, Will, on the village of Lydiate near Liverpool with Hopkins and his two poems, Felix Randall and Spring and Fall. Um, to tell you a little of the background of Will, he completed his schooling at the European School in Brussels in the very early days of Ireland and the UK's membership of the EU. Having studied English literature at Reading University, he went on to spend his career in English state secondary schools and latterly as head teacher. After retiring, Will completed an MA in creative writing at Edge Hill University. These studies led indirectly to the submission to the Hopkins Quarterly of a piece called Hopkins in Lydiate and the Hinterland to spring and fall, which appeared in the winter spring 2018 issue. Recently, he has also edited two posthumous works of selected poems, Pleading at the Bar of Truth by Eddie Wainwright and Writing on the Rock by Tim Noble. Six of Will's poetry collections have been published, including three by Belfast's Lapwing, and another which was an Indigo Dreams collection winner. His work has appeared widely, most recently in Orbis, Envoi, Smoke, The High Window, and, <clears throat> sorry, Poetry Village. He won first prize in the VER Poets 2009 competition, and he's been shortlisted or commended in competitions run by Poetry Nottingham, Envoi, Virginia Warby, Sentinel, James Kirker, Swale Life, The Poetry Kit, Southport Writers, and Leaf. That's quite a history. Will has written reviews um, for Envoi, Palsa, New Hope International, Tears in the Fence, and Lynx. Living in Lancashire in the UK, Will is currently working on what sounds like a most intriguing enterprise. I believe it's been part published, uh, a sequence of 100 poems of 100 syllables each called England's Edging. So uh, to end this uh, from one of Will's poems, Sunday Shoes, I give you um, a couple of lines after saying a uh, little quote from somebody else. Isn't it truly amazing how the sight of some familiar discarded object can often trigger off a whole kaleidoscope of cherished recollections? And those lines are, we should be hard and happier and facing freedom with hotter blood, not dismay. And say that we look forward to his talk with Hot blood. Will. Thank you, Irene. Hello from Lancashire. And I wanted to start by um, pointing to some very simple parallels between the Lydiate context over this side of the water and the Monastery Reverend uh, context on your side of the water. In both cases, we have Hopkins leaving a busy maritime city, Liverpool or Dublin leaving what um, Larkin called the toad work, to a degree at least, to go and stay with and probably say mass for um, wealthy Catholic families in small villages or towns in the hinterland. And in that sense of escape, where the strangers reached out to him, as Richard was saying in his introduction, we have a sense of Hopkins being able to, in one way or another, switch his mindset and his creativity to something rather different. My opening slide was going to be a picture of Hopkins in 1880, which is the critical time as far as this talk is concerned, but it's copyright to the National Portrait Gallery. So instead, I've just put a slide of a uh, local guide that I wrote following on from uh, the piece that was in the Hopkins Quarterly to try and bring the Hopkins story 
to people, particularly in this area, but also in the in the wider wor Hopkins world, bring the story of Hopkins and Lydia to life. Now, if you want to imagine what it was like for Hopkins, he was moved to Liverpool in 1880 to join the Jesuit community at St. Francis Saviour, or SFX as it's popularly known in the city, a large Catholic community um, with up to eight Jesuit priests working together and serving areas of extreme deprivation, particularly running down the hill where the church has been placed in a, in a very impressive position down towards the city, the railway, the smog and the disease filled areas of what was and even until fairly recently remained a pretty segregated area between the Catholic communities many of which were of Irish, Irish heritage and the uh, Protestant communities. It remains a most impressive church, uh, big, airy, welcoming, well-organized, and the Jesuit tradition remains. Uh, there's a similar church in Preston called St Wilfrid's where Hopkins stayed briefly, um, where the Hopkins heritage is deeply revered. Um, but inevitably, there aren't eight priests at uh, SFX anymore. Hopkins preached from this pulpit, uh, which you can see was built to last. If you look very closely, there's an amusing little extra at the bottom here, which is a, a Jesuit priest who's been kind of sculpted to hide underneath the pulpit. If we remember that Hopkins himself was only about five foot tall, you could almost imagine him fitting rather neatly into that little alcove. How his preaching went down, rather as Hillary was suggesting earlier, is a bit of a moot point. And um, one of the elderly parishioners was asked after the publication of Hopkins' book, what he was like. And she said, oh, that Father Hopkins, he had a temper. And Hopkins' impetuousness I think is one of the many, char many characteristics of his, his extraordinary creative energy. And we'll touch on that again shortly. Um, you, you'll see it here, the census for 1881 as taken at SFX. And you will see if you can follow my cursor somewhere right in the middle of the screen there, you will see Jared Hopkins one of the eight priests who were serving there. And I, I did read one piece of criticism that suggested there was a significant Irish contingent in terms of the Jesuit community there. That may have been the case at some times, but I can't fit it in, but certainly all of the priests at that time were actually English. Um, and, and as a little piece of general history, that's quite interesting. I'm not aware of the, if, if, what Jesuit connections there are between Monastery Revin and uh, Dublin, but there is a very strong Jesuit connection between Lydiate and St Francis Saviour. And it marks the similarities between Lydiate and Liverpool, which are otherwise uh, difficult to find. Lydiate is one of those places which captures the old recusant Lancashire tradition. Lancashire is the most Catholic of English counties. And when you walk around a Catholic churchyard in Lydiate, you will see a lot of old Lancashire surnames. Whereas of course, in the city, things were very different. The extreme poverty and disease, the difficulties for the uh, priests in serving that community on a day-to-day -day basis, the dangers of serving that community in terms of their own health were profound. And in Lydiate, for, sh for sure, he found somewhere that was peaceful and somewhere that he could enjoy. One of the priests who served from St Francis Saviour was Randall Lithgow. He was the brother of the wife whose house his ma mass was served in by Hopkins and many of the other Jesuits. And Jesuits had been working in Lydiate for at least 150 years before Hopkins set foot in the village. There's more about that to follow, but that Jesuit connection provided him with a way in. I think one of the things that's really important in understanding perhaps what was happening to Hopkins' mindset when he was in our part of the world, in South West Lancashire, was that he was trying to find ways out. 
He talks, for example, about going out to the river, the River Mersey, um, in January 1881, when the river was freezing. And here's a, a contemporary picture of what it might have looked like. He says, well, I went. The river was coated with dirty yellow ice from shore to shore. Where the edges could be seen, it seemed very thick. It was not smooth, but many broken pieces framed or pasted together again. It was floating downstream with the ebb tide. It everywhere covered the water, but was not of a piece, being continually broken, ploughed up by the plying of the steam ferry boats. And that contrast between the force, the natural force of the river and the dirt of the pollution in the river is a good image to try and capture what's going on in Hopkins' mind as he tries to find ways out of the city, literally or metaphorically. This was one of the places he traveled to, although obviously it didn't look like that in his day. It's a nondescript outskirt near the Liverpool Ring Road. But in Hopkins' day, it looked more like this. This is an old Jesuit mission. It actually closed or was taken over by other parish priests shortly after Hopkins' stay in the northwest of England. But this was a presbytery um, served by Jesuit priests and around the same sort of time that Hopkins was experiencing that severe cold in the winter of 8081, he goes out for a walk to Gill Moss, I think to stay with the Jesuits there, and he gets lost. I am by this niggling pen at Gill Moss, having just walked out of town by frost and starlight. I saw deep drifts frozen as hard as ice, and I don't know what to think of this part of the country. I lost my way, but two children fetching milk led me, saying, you must follow us. Nothing strikes me, and then he stops. Obviously, these days, those children, were he to meet them, would have spoken with a Liverpool accent. But back in that time, they would have spoken with the local rural Lancashire accent, which Hopkins was particularly attracted to when he served in Lee, which is about 10 miles east of, of uh, Gilmoss. Uh, and there was a wedding there, which led to his poem at the wedding march. He was much more interested in the vernacular of his parishioners. And sad to say, because of, of the wonderful place that it is, Liverpool was not Hopkins' favorite place. Hillary already alluded to that. It was a place he found extremely challenging physically, spiritually, mentally, and, and creatively. A really difficult place for him. Here's another part of modern Liverpool, which in, in Hopkins' day would have been very close to the church of SFX. It would have looked a little bit like that for Hopkins. I'm sure there was a pub there, just as I'm sure there weren't any vans parked in the road like that. But that's the head of Birchfield Street, if you know the Liverpool-born Catholic heritage British writer Jimmy McGovern, his father was born in this street. And the street bears a particular importance in terms of understanding Hopkins' limited output at this time. He would have walked down this street in 1880 to serve many parishioners. Here we see it shortly before its demolition which would have been some time after the Second World War. You can see the evidence of the Second World War there. That's a bomb shelter in the middle of the street. And you can see the, two, the three children on the right-hand side who are standing next to bomb damage, which was a consequence of the substantial Liverpool Blitz. But Hopkins went about his parish life very dutifully. He buried a lot of children who died uh, in infancy. Uh, and he also, buried people like Felix Spencer, who died on the 21st of April 1880. I'm sorry it's a bit difficult to read, but effectively, like many others in the, of the time, poor Felix died of TB or associated lung disease. You will, I'm sure, be familiar with the poem Felix Randall, uh, which we can see here. I'm not going to read it all to you because it's a poem that um, I'm sure you're familiar with. 
the title of it is interesting because of the speculation as to why he changed the surname from Spencer, which was the name of the blacksmith, the farrier who died, to Randall. There are probably three, perhaps three explanations. I think he changed the name in part to protect the individual. He did that again in uh, other poems, uh, in Brothers, which he was working on at the time, in At the Wedding March. He doesn't follow the truth exactly in terms of describing something that was based on a real event. Who was the Randall? I think there are probably two possibilities there. One was a tribute to Randall Lithgow, the Jesuit priest who I mentioned previously. And the other was a, a layman who he met in his time at Lydiate, Randall Lightbound, who I'll come back to shortly. When we look at this poem, I think we see another theme which is quite important in the poetry that Hopkins was working on or trying to work on in his time in Liverpool. It's not a particularly religious poem. Neither is Brothers and neither, despite it being about a, a wedding, is at the wedding march. I think his poetry at this time suggests a frustration, a loneliness and not, not an alienation from his faith at all but some questioning of his faith, which was of course not, this was not the only time this happened. But here we have a poem that captures the force of a life brought to a rapid end. And there is religious language in there, but to me, it doesn't strike me as a particularly religious poem. I think he's more interested in this sense of a tree falling in a large forest before its time. Didst fettle for the great grey dray horse's bright and battering sandal. We think of blacksmiths now, of course, as being completely rural if we can find them at all. But back in the 1880s, there would have been blacksmiths and farriers everywhere, just as there would have been horses everywhere. Hopkins', impe Hopkins impetuousness was well represented by a ridiculous situation completely of his own creation that took place on one of his regular railway journeys out to Lydiat to serve the Lightbound family and their friends in their private chapel. On one of these journeys, he happened to strike up a conversation with uh, a local um, uh, Liverpool merchant called Musgrove about, and we've heard this before, politics. And he said in one of his letters, Mr. Musgrove is a radical. He handed about a portrait of Lord Ramsay saying, the future member for Liverpool. I hope, said Hopkins, that this is not the portrait of a future member for Liverpool. And then they had a bit of an argument. This was rather difficult for Hopkins' companion, who was one of the light bound sons, grown up and working for Mr. Musgrove. And it was clearly very embarrassing for the Lightbounds to see Hopkins taking on their boss in public in a railway carriage. Hopkins realized he messed this up, but rather reluctantly and with a considerable degree of satire of John Lightbound, the unfortunate younger brother, decided on a reconciliation with Mr. Musgrove after I think a lot of grumbling. So in, on the 30th of April in 1880, they met at the railway station you can see in the slide, probably in the building you can see on the right hand side, just behind the gentleman there with the rather fetching boater on his head. And Hopkins writes to his mother, I did not tell you then of the friendly scene of reconciliation between Mr Musgrove and me, which I determined to bring about next time we should meet, and luckily I was with the more genial Randall Lightbound, not with Mr. Musgrove's high priest, John. It took place on a bitter cold morning by a glowing waiting room fire at Town Green Station. I advanced and ate humble pie ravenously. Mr. M was very good natured and himself finished the dish. This was a a very good representation 
of how Hopkins would sometimes let things get the better of him. Unfortunately, that room, that waiting room has been closed as a waiting room for a long time and it's now actually a police station, which is rather, rather ironic. Um, and it's still there. The Victorians built things to last. If you look at this part of the station here, that is where probably Hopkins ate his humble pie. And I think he really enjoyed that experience. It was an escape. It was an opportunity to engage in some intellectual um, tit for tat. And he, I think he also enjoyed embarrassing the local family who were actually very good to him. The local family lived in a house called Rose Hill. Rose Hill House is on a lane called Pygans Hill, which is actually a very flat part of South Lancashire, just before the, the hills begin. And it was owned by a benevolent Catholic called Thomas Lightbound, a widower by the time that Hopkins came to serve mass there. Twelve children, some of them priests, some of them sisters, and a few of them, but not many of them, with family. So Hopkins would have rolled up there. He would have, as he says, often stayed the night. And it was in those circumstances that he was able to find out more about the life of rural Catholic Lancashire in the late 19th century. This photograph was taken probably around the turn of the century. So probably about 20 years after Hopkins was, would visit. But if you look at the right hand, the left hand side of the house there, which still exists, the chapel, was on the top floor there. And John Lightbound, the son who was on the train with Hopkins when he was traveling into Liverpool, had a daughter and his daughter helpfully, although illegibly, managed to explain through a little bit of a dawdle over another picture that there was a priest's room, chapel and sacristy just on that left-hand side of the first floor. That was old Catholic Lancashire, almost non-existent now. Very patriarchal where you'd have two or three Catholic families who owned an awful lot of land, who would have their own private arrangements for mass. This was not the only place that you could get to mass in the locality as we'll find, but it was where the posh folk went. And it was an important part, I think, of helping, that sense of escape was an important part of helping Hopkins to write in what limited sense he could. He doesn't always take things in. That's the view he would have seen every time he walked out of the house, with obviously some, some changes. But he refers to the house on one occasion as Rose Hall, quite absent-mindedly. He gets the date wrong on at least one occasion when he's writing to his mother about his frequent visits there. But he would have seen certainly the farm next door and he would have seen certainly the wood at the bottom of the garden. Mischievously I've put as his heading for that slide a golden grove at Rose Hill. There is absolutely no suggestion that the golden grove we'll refer to shortly was anything to do with Rose Hill House in Lydiate. The family of, who live there now have confirmed that to me. And the house has probably changed time four, times four times since the late 1890s when the Lightbound family left. But the family themselves have referred to that little wood as Golden Grove. And rather movingly, the current owner said his mother, Margaret, rather, rather coincidentally, used to sit there in her dying days in the old chapel, which is no longer a chapel, looking out onto what she called Golden Grove. And the gardener, incidentally, there is known as Gerard. In the 1880s, if you looked at the 81 census, you'd have seen a variety of family coming and going. So when I first started thinking about this place as a place that Hopkins had visited, I was drawn into thinking that perhaps Hopkins had been very friendly with a lot of the family and got to know them really well. I'm not so sure about that. And when we come to look at spring and fall, I'd ask the question whether perhaps if it refers to anybody, it's not the people, the children and the various grandchildren who'd be coming and going that he met at Rose Hill. 
although he often traveled there, stayed there and enjoyed going there. I'm sorry if that's been slightly obscured by uh, that, but just a, as an aside, the first time I visited Rose Hill, the owner gave me a piece of paper. And he said, I found this hanging on a tree this morning. It's odd, isn't it? It's pretty odd that anybody would go to a house and hang a poem on a tree, for starters. You'll see it's dated the 7th of September, 1880, which was the first date that Hopkins recognizes as being when he wrote Spring and Fall. But it's a quotation from God's grandeur, which is, which is strange. But it is, it is a haunting place to visit. Just on a technical note, some people talk about Hopkins traveling to Rose Hill from Lydiate Station. That's an error. Uh, the Lydiate Station wasn't open. It's on a separate, it was on a separate railway line that no longer exists. There's a picture there to give you more of a sense of the landscape that Hopkins would have seen of the footpath he might have walked along by the side of Rose Hill House as he made his way in there to, to say mass. The landscape is pleasant, undulating rather than hilly, as you can see in that picture. But it's also a landscape which is coloured by the Jesuit heritage. Hopkins would have seen and might have visited the old Catholic Tudor Manor House of Lydiat Hall. That now barely exists, but it was the classic recusant Catholic family home with a priest's hole, and because of the Jesuit connections, um, a, a regular attendance of Jesuit priests serving it for mass well into the 19th century. It now looks more like this. Is, it is almost unnoticeable with, with no sign, no indication that you might want to visit it. Over the field, there is an old Catholic chapel built by the Catholic family back in the 16th century, open for only about 50 years before the Reformation got in the way and it was sacked. A few, a few items from it were rescued and it's, it remains a ruin to this day. But if we think about Hopkins and the world that he was encountering there, we can see how he, there were things out in the Lancashire countryside that gave him more of a sense of the positives in his life, the hidden life of a Jesuit priest. There's a record here of Jesuits who were buried semi-secretly in the chapel uh, during the time of post-reformation, but the time where they still had to be fairly careful about their worship. And things had started to change in Lydiate, because in, the, in about 1850, a combination of local families and the Jesuits from Liverpool built a, a large Catholic church called Our Ladies. Hopkins would have known that. He didn't say mass there. There's no evidence that he did that, but he would have known it because of the Lightbound family's strong connections with that parish. The last Jesuit priest left there shortly after it opened, and from then it was served from Liverpool by the, the archdiocese. These days it looks a little bit different because in the, the 1930s the spire had to be removed for health reasons. To get an impression of how important the Lightbound family were in the life of Hopkins and his visits to that part of Liverpool, you only need to step outside the, um, the door of the church and you will see the Lightbound grave right near the entrance, which dominates everything in the churchyard. Thomas Lightbound, his wife Catherine and three of their children are buried there. After Hopkins' time in Lydiate, Randall Lightbound, who might have been the source of the, um, who might have been the source of the um, surname in Felix Randall, built an extraordinary altarpiece in the church, really quite overwhelming, as a tribute to his mother and to his father. And you can see there Thomas and Catherine on one side of the altar, and their surnames and their death dates there. At the back of the church, there are also examples of relics that, uh, um, that were antiquities that was, were rescued from the old 
uh, St. Catherine's Chapel, telling the story of St. Catherine of Alexandra through a series of about seven reredos. Uh, very attractive and, and very small. So what about this poem, Spring and Fall? I don't think it bears comparison to any of Hopkins' other poems. Its subheading, which isn't there, but you will, you will remember, I'm sure, is To a Young Child. That in itself is an unusual thing for Hopkins to say. He doesn't say who it's addressed to any more than that it's to a young child, to a girl. Its title is also interesting because we always, I suppose, think of it as being spring and fall as a seasonal poem. But when he was writing about the poem and drafting it, a poem which, remember, he said he was not well pleased with, at least when he first worked on it, he talks about its sprung rhythm and falling cadence. It is a 15 line poem with a particular rhyme scheme, mainly couplets, but not in the middle. It is a faithless poem, and I'm being provocative by saying that. But to me, it is a poem without faith. It is a poem addressed to perhaps an imaginary child, trying to explain to them through autumnal metaphors and other things, the nature of mortality. That's pretty grim reading for a young person, if it was ever intended for a young person. Or was it intended for us as adults to remember what it's like to be young and to not have that veil of fear and knowledge and understanding? That summer in 1880, Hopkins had been very busy. He probably saw some of his family in London because he was certainly in London. He went on a retreat. He, he was working very hard. He comes back to Liverpool. The work shifts and becomes even more difficult for him. The poem is an autumn poem. But if you think about it, all that autumnal imagery in it, the wanwood leaf meal. And that sense of autumn colours that we feel, the leaves falling would have been imagined and anticipated, not observed. Because as we know, in early September, most of the leaves are sitting quite happily in the trees and haven't started to turn. So I think the poem captures more his sense of the winter approaching, the work approaching, and the fact that whatever he saw of his family, who was so important to him, was disappearing rapidly. The last part of my talk is a speculation, and it's only a speculation, although I want to share with you some thoughts about that relationship between Hopkins and his family and how important it was to him. He often went on holiday with some of his family to Whitby. That's a painting of Whitby by his brother Arthur. And he and Arthur were competitive artists. Arthur was the better artist. He illustrated the first edition of The Return of the Native, for example, and he did a lot of, he was a professional artist. But unfortunately, Jared was quite bossy. So he would lay into Arthur's artwork at regular intervals and tell him how it should have been done better. And although Jared clearly was a good draftsman, he didn't have anything like the track records, really be in a position to boss his brother around like that. But as we'll see, it was a strong and affectionate relationship. Arthur was also rather dapper, very different in appearance from Jared. He had that irritating 19th century habit of being able to look both bohemian and smart at the same time. We're not very good at that these days. Arthur, we know, was painting and drawing and on holiday with his family in August 1880. And Jared would have known that and was probably a little bit jealous of him because there was nothing he liked better than being away with his family and painting. And Arthur had a little daughter, uh, Beatrice Muriel Hopkins. That's her wedding certificate, which is from 1908. And you'll see Arthur's signature at the bottom there. In London, of course, because that's where they lived. You may have read 
Beatrice's or Beatrice Handley Derry, as she was known after her wedding, you may have read her a little memoir because there aren't that many people who actually wrote about what they remembered of Gerard Manley Hopkins. And she writes it, it, it she wrote it in old age, I think in about 1940. Um, but she writes an interesting memoir about what it was like to be Hopkins only niece nephew. She describes herself as being small and delicate. And she says, Beatrice's uncle used to come and sit by my bed and talk to me. His kindness and sympathy were unfailing. And she talks about the holidays they shared in London and Whitby. She says he was extraordinarily lucid, would explain things to me as a child. He went to the heart of it and cleared the air. It was all done so simply, yet everything became clear. So in my speculation, I just got curious about the Whitby connection because we know from Beatrice's writing that she'd been to Whitby with uh, Jared before, although probably not in 1880. And there is indeed a place just outside the town called Golden Grove, which is a hamlet, one particular house known as Golden Grove, and the woodland around it is, is also known as Golden Grove. It's a pleasant area up the hill, out of the town, quarter of an hour, 20 minutes walk. There's an old footpath there that will be certainly 19th century. It's, it's those wonderful old sandstone flags that people used to lay for country walking. And it was interesting to read in one of the, the, the almanacs of the early 19th, the 20th century, that the woods which begin by the river were the frequent resort of artists. And I'll show you a picture in a moment to suggest to you the sort of views that people like Arthur and perhaps Gerard would have seen in their journeys around Whitby. Because the great thing about that, that town is that you've got the seascapes which so fascinated Arthur and Gerard. One of their big argu artistic arguments is about how do you draw a wave with difficulty, obviously. Um, and, and Arthur was pretty good at it. But also there is a rural hinterland which would have uh, interested them because they were both fascinated by drawing trees. And this view is the view from Larpool of the River Esk as it wends its way out towards the sea. That's the view that they're talking about in the Almanac, which was particularly popular with artists. So my speculation is, why would Hopkins in 1880 have suddenly decided he wanted to write a, a, a poem addressed to a young child. There are a thousand reasons for that. But he did have a particularly good relationship with his niece. He writes to his mother about her precocious rheumatism. And it's interesting how she talks about the way in which, despite his, his frequent sense of fun in his conversations with her, he would often, it would appear, talk to her about more difficult matters something that she remembered in old age. And she would have been at the time when he wrote Spring and Fall, she'd have been about eight, something like that, seven or eight, something like that. Whitby remained for the Hopkins family a really important place. And I'm just going to leave you with a quotation from Arthur. After the awfulness of Hopkins' death, his parents rushing across the Irish Sea, to be with him in that final illness. There is, as I'm sure you're aware, a, a, an exchange of letters between the family. And Arthur writes this. Of his brother, he says, he prefers to retain the recollection of him at Whitby last summer and the vision in my memory of the marvelously beautiful expression that was in his face as he bid us goodbye when he left us. It brought tears into my eyes then, and in some distant way, I felt that I should see his face no more. And another Jesuit quotation from the Pope to finish with, to just make another little Jesuit connection. The Pope himself is an admirer of Gerard Manley Hopkins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. That was that was really lovely and 
gives us some idea of Lydiate and its connection with Hopkins. Can, can I just say that in, in passing, can I say that at a festival we had back in the 1990s, a gentleman called in briefly, he was passing through Monaster Avenue, it was before the motorway, and he said, I just saw the sign for the Hopkins Festival and said I'd call in. You know, I'm a great, great grand nephew of the gentleman farrier that was spoken of in the poem. Nice. And he just left. So we didn't get an opportunity to make contact with him again. But I thought it was just a little anecdote that you might enjoy. The festival at that time was held in the Hazel Hotel, I remember. Um, do we have any questions for William? If I may, it's not so much a, a question. I was very interested to hear about his contacts and interactions with, if you like, the better class. Most of what I've read has been about his, generally his congregants, the less educated and the difficulties they had listening to him and understanding him. Uh, so that was quite illuminating. I, I had not read anything of that before. Thank you, Will. The, the, the chapel itself is, would have been very small, so it would have been a very select gathering, probably some friends, but but the family, as you'll have gathered, was large enough in itself to fill it. Um, and, and I think there was just a kind of, a, 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 perhaps an unwritten agreement between uh, St Francis Saviour in Liverpool and the Lightbound family because of their interconnections that they would provide this service for as long as they could. And as, I don't know when it ended, but it, it, it certainly continued well after Hopkins' short stay in Liverpool. Thank you. Can, can I just say, Will, uh, that Monaster Evan didn't have any particular um, connections with the Jesuits. I couldn't find any, but then, you know, it, it, I wasn't confident that I'd had the research tools to be able to do that. So I didn't want to presuppose it. Um, I think you, you, can you, see the, you can see the similarity in terms of the, the you know, the, 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 the well-known uh, local Catholic families uh, welcoming him in. Yes, yes, that's very noticeable. Um, I, I, I do recall distantly that... I, I think it was in Farm Street in 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 London. He gave a, a sermon and mentioned about the gifts of the Holy Ghost being dispensed uh, as a, and gave the image of a, a milking cow, and the, the church was dispensing the graces. But I think that didn't go down very well with his colleagues. <laughs> I think Hillary has her hand up there, um, Wayne. Yes, I've, I've, I've got uh, Hillary's um, comment there, which is inviting a, a discussion about uh, the interpretation of the poem. Um, I mean, I won't start that, I think, because I've, I've kind of said my piece unless you want me to. <laughs> no, no, thank you so much. That was truly illuminating. So much there I did not know. And um, I, I am really convinced by your researches in Whitby. That makes a lot of sense because you know, that, that he writes it in Lydiate has got nothing to do with where he's right, where he gets his uh, inspiration from, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, you happen to be in one place while you're thinking about another. Actually, poets quite often like to be in a different place. Yeah. From, yeah. So, so and, and it, it kind of rings true because as you say, we know how attached he was to family. And, and I suspect quite rightly that he, it, rather as with Felix Spencer, he'll have changed the name because he didn't want to put Beatrice. Mm. That, it's all speculation, but it kind of makes psychological sense. Yeah. But I just wondered, you said it was an autumn poem. And and I think it's, it's spring and fall, just as he says. Um, and it begins in spring and ends in autumn. Perhaps that's, I don't know whether that's a very small point. 
I think, oh, well, I, I think leaves like the things of man you with your fresh thoughts care for, can you? And then, you know, so he's in spring yeah. and then he starts thinking about precisely, as yeah. you say, the fall of man, uh, not the fall yeah. of man, but the fall, yeah. Yeah. the autumn in man the, and the things coming. Um, and it kind of, it turns, you know, because she's possibly weeping in spring and he's sort yeah. of saying, you yeah. know, there will be other things that will come, which will be much more serious and you won't even weep at that point, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. Such you will cut it will come to such sites colder, nor spare a sigh. Mm. You know, as we all know that that as you grow older, older people weep less, not because they feel less, but somehow they just sort of do. Mm. Um, um, and then it, it's a wonder, it's a wonderfully serpentine, circular poem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's interesting also in that the language is quite. It's quite stripped back, not completely. When you've got one wood leaf meal and you know very Hopkins esque yeah. constructions sure. like that, but it, it's at times it's quite stripped back, and yeah. and I would suggest that maybe reflects the life that he was leading and the fact that that his inspiration, whatever that means, hmm. was proving difficult. Possibly, and also he does experiment here and there, not often as you say, with writing slightly sparer stuff mm. and maybe maybe it was also a kind of as we know he did poetic exercise mm. again we can't know so oh well i so much uh, enjoyed your talk and uh and, and very we had been in touch you know and um it's wonderful to see you and to hear you live and i really enjoyed that and, and in terms of spring and fall i love the comment that uh, it's very thoughtful comment that you made is it really for a young person or is it a comment for all of us? Uh, is, is that the message of the, of the poem? And I think in your booklet anyway, in your book, you do say that it could reflect the difficult time that he was having. And, and that, that might be you know, expressing some of, his, some of his own thoughts about mortality and so on. Well done, well, I really have enjoyed Thank you, thank you, Dudley. Watching you there, watching, wonderful, wonderful. I'll just give you a, a very brief anecdote because I think it's also perhaps about loneliness. Um, I did, I did a version of this talk in in the Catholic Church Parish Hall in Ormskirk, which is where I live, just three miles from Lydia. And I, I mentioned this thing about the loneliness that priests can feel and the, how important their relationship with their family is. And at the end of it, the parish priest came up to me and he said, thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Very good. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, go on, go on, go on. I finish, finish. No. Sorry, go on, Dudley. I'd like to hear what you had to say. No, I was just going to say, as, as a side, really, I, can I just commend um, Will's book, the you know the the the, uh, the Hopkins connections at Lydiard. I found it. I, I did a walk around Lydiard, based uh, and I found the book very very helpful. And I've written an article about that about my my uh, wanderings of the lanes of Lydiard, and that will be appearing in Hopkins mag Hopkins Society magazine, the journal, uh, in a few months. Lovely. Lovely, we look forward to that. And, uh, Sorry, Richard, I was just going to say thank you very much for that. I managed to get uh, Professor Joe Feeney, the, the Jesuit uh, Hopkins um, academic over on, on the other side of the pond, to, uh, to write a piece at the end of my little book. Uh, and it's about a visit he had to the house in the, I think the 1990s, when the parents of the current owners were living there and when the room that was the chapel was still more like it. I'm afraid the house itself has gone through a period of being rented out, but the owner is now moving back in and is in the process of substantial refurbishments. But uh, at that time, uh, the, the short piece that, that uh, Joe, uh, Joe Feeney wrote uh, gave a very nice uh, insight into you know, an almost a last sight of what that chapel might have been like. Mm -hmm. Good. Sorry, Richard. Do we need to go uh, move uh, move on? The time is 
moving on and uh, we can return to any further questions later, I think, after the poetry reading.